Uh, hi there. Phil Simborg again for the USBGF. And here is a checker play uh, for a money game or unlimited game uh, with a cube turn. Blue's holding the cube, and red has a double three to play. And uh, I was red here, and I can tell you the first thing that hits you is how upset you are that you didn't make the four point with this roll. So you have to make the best of it. And I didn't. Uh, so uh, I thought about it. I analyzed it. I looked at it. And I came up with, I think, some reasons. But I wanted to be sure. So I called on my good friend and uh, one of the top players in the world, John O'Hagan, uh, one of our teaching partners at the uh, Back End and Learning Center, who's here today to explain this play and why you should make the right play. So before he does that, I'll give you a couple of minutes to take a look and see what you think is the right play. What would you do? Let's see if you're as smart as John O'Hagan or as dumb as Phil Simborg. <laughs> okay, John, take it away. Do you want to see the analysis first? Do you don't want to talk about it, or what do you prefer? Did I lose you? No, I'm here. Oh, okay. How would you like to start on this, Jeff? Okay. Uh, are you ready to start now? Yeah, let's go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, so with this position now, um, you are 20 pips behind before the roll. So after you play double threes, you'll be eight, eight pips behind. And the opponent owns the cube, and the opponent has one checker back and currently a stronger board, but you're certainly going to make your two-point, so you, both sides will have a four-point board. And most of you have probably heard the saying that when you are uh, working on a position where the opponent has one checker back, you generally, everything else being equal, you generally want to attack rather than prime. The problem with the priming approach is that if blue gets out, then your nice prime doesn't really matter much. Um, and the problem with just making the two point here is that it gives blue good threes and good sixes. Uh, threes hit, of course, and sixes, except for six one and six two, fully escape. And um, you are down in the race, so that's not good. And um, so after you make the two point with three of your threes, you're better off hitting four to one with the uh, fourth three. And yeah, so now you've got one more three to go, and so you do that. So that leaves a total of 12 hitting numbers, but um, the uh, that's only one extra hitting number. Uh, but uh, the key is that the entering fours, uh, while 4-4 four, four hits uh, and 4-6 gets out, the uh, fours don't play as well for him in this position as the sixes do in the other position. And also, um, one, one other factor that comes into play here, in addition to the fact you're playing against one man back, is that the opponent owns the cube. So um, if blue rolls a one, for example, and uh, maybe a one three or one six, or really about just anyone, and then you dance, um, he, you know, it sort of depends on what his other number was, I guess, but uh, he might well be able to double you out and have a pretty big pass. Uh, whereas uh, with the priming play, if he rolls a six something and gets out without hitting, he might eventually come to a position where he can offer an efficient redouble. Um, so therefore, uh, when the opponent owns the cube and you have two plays that you think in terms of overall equity are roughly equivalent, one of them, though, gives him a chance to completely turn the game around right away, namely like here, by hitting you back. And the other one is more likely just to lead to a race. Uh, everything else being equal, you should uh, lean towards the uh, play that leaves sort of the uh, uh, where uh, one shot by the opponent might well determine who's going to win this game. Because if he hits and you dance, uh, you know, he might have a big double and he'll have a big pass. So the cube doesn't do him much good because he almost certainly would have won if he, there was no cube available anyway. Whereas if you don't hit him and he rolls a six, 
later on he might give you a uh, redouble when you are pretty far behind in the race but you have the 21 point holding game and you might be able to take you might not but it's going to be close so it's going to be an efficient redouble for him so the combination i think of all those reasons means you should hit with the last three that's what okay I mean. let me let me add a couple of things and maybe ask a couple of questions along the way uh, yeah. you covered very well the difference of a cube efficiency if things go wrong and let me explain that just a little bit for possibly some intermediate or lower level players what John is saying is if you get hit here and blue gains a major advantage when he redoubles he might be at 85 or 90 percent favorite to win the game or such a huge favorite to win the game that when you drop you haven't really lost that much by dropping because he was going to win the game so much of the time anyway even if he didn't double you but if you're playing in a racing game what if he gets to the point where he's like 74 or 75 percent favorite or maybe even 76 percent or something like that and let's say he doubles you and you drop he's picked up 25 percent of uh, wins because he now wins the game those 25 percent he would have lost if he didn't have the cube to use so he has a more efficient use and if you take the cube it's also very efficient because now most of his wins are going to be at the four level instead of at the two level so that gives him the leverage also so he has more leverage or more cube big in a racing game than he does in a hitting game when he's holding the cube when you're holding the cube if you were holding the cube in the same position it might not change the play but it would make the difference far less and in many situations it actually does change the play uh... did i say that correctly john yes he did yeah good yes. now in addition uh... the other factors are what happens when he doesn't hit if you get away with this play and he doesn't hit you have a very good chance of covering the ace point with a five seven or an eight and your odds are pretty good that you'll cover the ace point even if you don't again the, his, the odds aren't uh, in his favor to hit it the next time and you'll maybe cover it the next time picture what happens if you cover the ace point here now you've got some time to catch up in this race to get these back checkers moving and come around and de develop a very strong game if you make the other play where you leave the blot on the three point and bring this checker in instead is that, that this checker would be here instead no it would be um, let's go back to the original I forget. <laughs> so I make sure I get it right. Uh, this is position eight. Let's make sure I get it right. Um, if you make the other play, which is a nine percent error, here's what that looks like. And let's say that you're lucky here, and he doesn't hit you. You still have to cover this point, which you probably will do. But you still have to worry about him rolling sixes on the next roll and the next roll. And you still can't move these checkers out very comfortably because he's not on the bar and he can he can hit you if you try and move one checker out of here so even if this is successful you're not going to be in as good a position as if you can put him up in the bar and hopefully he stays you have the chance of him staying there for a little bit for a little while this is, so the downside is worse and the upside is worse and that's why the difference in plays is a nine percent difference in, in the play uh, I think that's a, a great explanation John and by the way John also didn't talk about the possibility of coming out with these checkers and why because you're down so much in the race uh, that uh, let's see before the roll again let's put it back here before the roll you're down 20 pips so it, it's kind of silly to play a racing game and also give up your anchor and leave a blot because when you give up the anchor and get hit then you're much more vulnerable to getting gammon after you move these checkers out so the, the play has to be here uh, John did mention that that uh, we have the saying about hitting the lone checker I think there's a saying that says prime a pair and hit a blot and that's right. set the same yeah. idea if blue had two checkers back you have a reasonable chance of building a prime and you don't have to worry about him rolling a six to escape he'd have to roll double sixes or two numbers mm -hmm. that get out so you can play more of a priming game so you're, the, the thought that has to come to mind here is you, be, you need to be playing a hitting game and not a priming game or a racing game. And if you start out with that theory, and you notice that's where John started, on what type of a game you're going to play. You start out with the game plan, and you realize that you have to play a hitting game here 
the play becomes uh, easy. If you have to hit and play a hitting game, then you hit, and then the other three, the other rest of the threes become very, very uh, simple. You certainly want to make another point in your board to make it that much harder for him to come in uh, if you hit. Uh, John, anything else to add about uh, yeah, this position? Um, yeah, uh, one one last comment. If you could uh, put the position after the correct play, where you uh, make the uh, uh, two point and put them on the roof. Okay, let's say that um, um, bl uh, blue fails to enter or enters with a four two or four five. Notice your diversification of numbers. You, uh, working on your four point, you'll have five scores and twos. And notice that those numbers are no good for escaping your back now. So you have threes and sixes to escape your back now. So you're not duplicating any of your good numbers. So that that's one other advantage of it. Aha. You know. uh -huh. So you're looking ahead to the next roll, and you see that this play not only hits, but it, it unduplicates your rolls going forward. Yeah, yeah. So, uh -huh. like, if uh, you know, uh, now if you roll a, a five four or a five two, you might have a tough choice to make. You just cover the ace, or do you make the four point? But uh, it's not going to be a question. Of, gee, do I escape or do I, you know, cover or or do I make my four point? Well, because I'm going to uh, go out and I'm going to go out and live and say you make the four point. But let's let's find out. That's I'm curious about that too. If we make the right play. And make the three point Two and points, hit, yeah. right. and he dances, and I roll the yeah. five four. I'm making the four point. Let's find out if yeah, that's right that's or not. Right. Uh, looks right. Yeah, by yeah. quite a yeah. bit. Yeah, quite a by bit. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, by a lot. Because I'm really, really. If I make the ace point, I'm sweating and rolling a four for several rolls. That's true. And if yeah. I make the exactly. four point, uh, even if he makes the yeah. ace point and comes in, I've got game. So yeah, uh, and it, then uh, if he rolls in response a one four, you know if he does hit you with a four, he's got to leave a direct shot for you too. Uh huh. Uh huh. And if he rolls a one five or one six, uh, well, it's a one six, it's good for him. He gets out, but the one five he's burying a checker, and a right. one three is you know a little awkward for him too. Yeah. So yeah. I, you're looking ahead to the next rolls as well. Yeah, yeah. I just want to point out that you're not uh, duplicating your, you know, your escaping numbers along with the numbers that make the four point. Mm -hmm. And so, right. So when I show this play to another expert, I said, "What do you think about uh, Red's play here?" He says, "Well, he shouldn't have doubled. <laughs> Blue yeah. shouldn't have been holding yeah. the cube here." And of course, when he doubled, it didn't look like this. It was right. it was actually right. a good double at the time. John, I want to thank you very much for your help on this video sure. and others, uh, and donating your time to the USBGF uh, is much appreciated. And the members, I hope, appreciate the the, the donation of your time and the others guest lectures that I have uh, that are just uh, here to help make the USBGF a better place to, to learn and to uh, share experiences. And we will see you soon. Good luck uh, in the Giants voting this uh, next month, and uh, hope to see you at a lot more tournaments next year. Okay. Sounds good, Thank Phil. Thanks. Bye-bye.